I mentioned this morning uh, that um, just because of the of what's been going on uh, in the Middle East um, and this this attack on um, the people of Israel, um, the home, the Jewish home state. Um, I don't know if you know this or not. I'm pretty sure that I've got this right, that when Israel became a nation, um, they, were, they were given leave to do that by the, what, what became the United Nations, and um, uh, they formed a, a nation state there in the area called Palestine. That was the, the historic name for it. Um, they basically uh, made it that anybody of Jewish descent um, automatically had citizenship uh, in the state of Israel. If you, in other words, if you were born a Jew, and it could be verified, I don't know exactly the parameters that they used, but you were automatically counted a citizen of the state of Israel. And... Um, so it didn't take much for a lot of European Jews, especially those that were still alive, um, to make their way down to this new, newly formed state of Israel. And um, I've, got a little, I've got a little theory in my head about um, the biblical side of them forming their own nation. Um, but that's not all that God's going to do with them. And I'll, I'll go show you that from Scripture tonight. Uh, as I said this morning during Sunday school, this is a teaching I've been doing here uh, for many years. Uh, God laid it on my heart, put it together. One, I think about the I think second homecoming we had uh, is when I taught this. I called it the glory of Israel or the salvation of Israel. And um, I use the Old Testament prophecies but also the picture of typology, that the, that the Bible, uh, the picture that the Bible draws you and it basically teaches you exactly what God's going to do uh, in the last days. Uh, something I do want to start out with, take your Bible, turn to the book of Obadiah. When's the last time you had anybody tell you to turn to Obadiah? Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel, Amos... Obadiah. It's one chapter. And um, Obadiah addresses this issue of Israel being attacked by her enemies and Edom, who basically is Jacob's brother, Esau did nothing about it. Um, let's look at this a little bit. Um, the vision of Obadiah, thus saith the Lord God concerning Edom, we have heard a rumor from the Lord, and an ambassador is sent among the heathen. Arise ye, and let us rise up against her in battle. Behold, I have made thee small among the heathen. Thou art greatly despised. The pride of thine heart hath deceived thee. Thou that dwellest in the clefts of the rock, whose habitation is high, that saith in his heart, who shall bring me down to the ground? Uh, that is a theme that if you look for it, you'll see it in Scripture. And um, I'm just going to say this. Read verse 4. Though thou exalt thyself as the eagle, though thou set thy nest among the stars, thence will I bring thee down, saith the Lord. It has fascinated me that the Apollo 11 patch, every Apollo astronaut group got to design their own patch for their uniforms, for their uh, spacesuits. And um, Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin, Mike Collins, they got to design the Apollo 11 patch. And they decided that they would have a, a picture of the moon and the earth in the background and an eagle with a twig, a branch in its claw, landing on the moon. And when you look at verse 4, that's exactly what is mentioned here. Though thou exalt thyself as the eagle, 
And though thou set thy nest among the stars, thence will I bring thee down, saith the Lord. What was it that Neil Armstrong said when they landed? Uh, Houston Tranquility Base here, the eagle has landed. And they literally established a nest on the moon because when they landed on the moon, a lot of people may not know this, they didn't just jump right out on the moon surface and go kicking rocks around. Um, the flight plan called for them that once they landed, um, they did a few things here and there, but they didn't leave uh, the Eagle capsule uh, for about another five or six hours. They uh, basically made some makeshift beds. I think uh, Neil slept on the floor and um, Buzz Aldrin took something, made a little cot out of it. And you remember, they only, those guys only weigh like 60 pounds on the moon. Okay, so any place you're going to lay down is going to be comfortable, no matter what. Okay, like floating on water. And they slept for about four or five hours, and then they, then they woke up, and then they did their moonwalk. And then they get back in the Eagle capsule, and they take another rest, break, sleep about five, six hours, something like that. And they wake up, and Mike Collins is ready to receive them when they launch back from the moon. But that's what they literally did. They built a nest among the stars. It had never been done before. And uh, I just thought it was interesting that that's right there. But you're going to find several places in the Old Testament where God has people um, taking flight among the stars and living there. I'm not going to go into that tonight. But... Let's keep reading. If thieves come to thee, if robbers by night, how art thou cut off? Would they not have stolen till they had enough? If the grass, grape gatherers came to thee, would they not leave some grapes? How are the things of Esau searched out? How are his hidden things sought up? All the men of thy confederacy have brought thee even to the border. The men that were at peace with thee have deceived thee and prevailed against thee. They that eat thy bread have laid a wound under thee. There is none with understanding in him. Shall I not in that day, saith the Lord, even destroy the wise men out of Edom and understanding out of the Mount of Esau? And the mighty men uh, and thy mighty men, O Teman, shall be dismayed to the end that every one of, of the Mount of Esau may be cut off by slaughter. For, viol for thy violence against thy brother Jacob, shame shall cover thee and thou shalt be cut off forever. Who did they have violence toward? Jacob, Israel. That's Jacob's name, Israel. In the day that thou stoodest on the other side, in the day that the strangers carried away captive his forces, and foreigners entered into his gates and cast lots upon Jerusalem, even thou wast as one of them. But thou, look at verse 12, but thou shouldest not have looked on the day of thy brother in the day that he became a stranger. Neither shouldest thou have rejoiced over the children of Judah in the day of their destruction. Neither shouldest thou have spoken proudly in the day of distress. Now, I'm, I'm not going to read any farther than that. But you get the idea of what Obadiah is about. God is very, very angry at Esau, Edom, because in the day that they should have assisted their brother Israel, they just stood and watch them be taken captive. Now, um, I am of the opinion that a great calamity is going to take place in Israel again. What was the sign that Jesus gave in Matthew 24, concerning the time of his coming. There shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. Now, in 70 AD, the Caesar of Rome sent forces down to invade Israel... They um, burnt Jerusalem. They destroyed the temple. 
dismantling it stone by stone, probably stealing all the gold that it had on it, and, um, and basically just destroyed the entire temple so that there was almost nothing left of it. Almost. What remains of the temple that was in Jerusalem? The Western Wall, the Wailing Wall, they call it. There you still have stone upon stone. That prophecy was partially fulfilled in A.D. 70. But I believe that that wall is going to come down. That's what I believe. And um, I may be wrong on that. I hope I've not destroyed your faith in God by my theories. But anyway, let's pray and then we'll, then we'll keep moving on. Father, we ask your blessings upon the word of God tonight. Lord, we're dealing with things of prophecy. And Father, the, they are always better understood after they happen. And uh, Lord, it is difficult because we see through a glass darkly us trying to look into the future to determine what is going to happen. Suffice it to say, God, that you have everything written down here in the scriptures. And Lord, I believe that everything that is going to happen is well in your hand. And there are no mistakes made by you whatsoever in the things that pertain to this earth, that pertain to uh, the people of Israel, the nation of Israel, and us Gentiles. Father, as you have carried Israel through the wilderness as on eagle's wings. Father, we also believe that you carry us into the promised land that you promised to give us because of our faith and our trust in you. Lord, we pray, dear God, that you would open up our eyes to help us to see uh, what may be in store for this world, what may be in store for the people of Israel and the nations of this world. And Lord, just give us some insight, we pray in Jesus' name. All of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Now, uh, I have Hosea 6 up on the screen. Turn there if you would. Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah. So if you, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea. Turn there. I don't have a song for the Old Testament books. I got one for the New Testament. Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea. Hosea chapter 6. I think um, this Bible is up upstairs. I bought a uh, life application Bible, NIV, for my wife years ago. It was a bad day, okay, um, for her birthday. And I spent 50 bucks on that. It was a lot of money for us, and, we, and she didn't like it. So it kind of hurt my feelings a little bit. And uh, so I said, fine, get your own Bible. So she got a King James. <laughs> she was smarter than I was in those days. But anyway, um, I remember reading the, the commentary. The Life Application Bible is full of commentary notes uh, underneath where the scripture is printed on each page. And when we read these verses, Come and let us return unto the Lord, for he hath torn and he will heal us. He hath smitten and he will bind us up. After two days will he revive us. In the third day he will raise us up and we shall live in his sight. Then shall we know if we follow on to know the Lord. His going forth is prepared as the morning. And he shall come unto us as the rain, as the latter and former rain unto the earth. Very quickly, briefly, the latter and former rain deal with uh, the rain that you get um, during springtime. When it's time for sowing seed you want some good rain some good gentle rains to come down and uh, give those seeds time to grow and time to send roots down into the ground so that they survive the summer the heat of the summer and then you want some good rains to come in harvest time uh, so that all the things that you have planted start ripening uh, at the right time and there's sufficient water for them to ripen and live and so on and so that's what the latter, the former rain would be, uh, from my understanding, the former rain would be uh, the sowing 
rain that you sow seed under. The latter rain is the harvest rain that you, that you harvest after. And uh, we always go out to Indiana every October. And uh, over the years, I've seen times when uh, we would get there and they already had everything harvested because the rains came and, and they, everything, everything ripened at the right time. Uh, and I've seen times out there where nothing was harvested. It's because too much rain came. They can't get the combines out in the field. They, they, they always have soybean and corn out there. And um, they, they, can't, they can't go out and get them because the ground's too muddy. Uh, and that's because of the latter rain. But anyway, the, the comment left by what, whatever idiot was commenting on this. He said, basically, at verse, verses 1, 2, and 3... That this was, this, was, uh, meant, this was said to Israel at a time when they were in serious rebellion to God. They were deep in sin. And that uh, this was something that the elders of Israel made up on their own. That uh, they believed that God would bless them. And uh, that God would give them the rains when they needed it and so on. And how dare they ask, for, ask these things for God. Uh, when they were living in sin and worshiping idols and things like that. And I read this and I'm going, where in the world does that come from? To me, it looks like this is what God is going to do. Uh, Let us return unto the Lord, for he hath torn and he will heal us. He has smitten and he will bind us up. How many of you have been smitten by God before? Amen. And But did he not bind the wound? Same hand that gives the hurt brings the heal. And uh, then is a time prophecy here in verse 2. The time prophecy is after two days. A day with the Lord is as a thousand years and a thousand years as a day. And, that, and there are double witnesses to that in, the, in Psalms and in Second Peter. And so after 2,000 years, God's going to revive Israel. In the third day, which would be the millennial reign of Christ... God is going to raise them up and they shall live in his sight. Now, think about that and then go to Ezekiel 37. What does God do in Ezekiel 37? Pray tell me. Israel is going to live in God's sight. Exactly what Hosea said would happen is going to happen. Whoever writes the comments for this junk that was in that Bible um, ought to be taken out and flogged. It's obvious that they didn't believe parts of the Bible. Obvious that, obvious that they didn't believe that God still had a salvation plan for, and I, I use this term, the genetic sons of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Those who are born Jews by birth. It's in their DNA. And um, that's why I, I, I said I, I'm pretty sure that, that I had read that and heard that, that at the formation of the, of the state of Israel, that if you were, if you were a, a Jew and had Jewish descendants, um, and, and I, don't, I don't know how far back that goes, but if you, were, if you had Jewish blood in you, you were automatically considered a, a, um, a citizen of the nation of Israel. And I think they allowed um, dual citizenship. In other words, if you were a citizen of the United States and you were like a New York Jew, um, you were offered citizenship in the, in the new state of Israel and were granted it. But anyway, uh, Ezekiel 37, look at verse 3. This is God talking to Ezekiel and he's looking at the valley and it's full of bones. And he said unto me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O Lord God, thou knowest. Now, uh, we see that Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. He had been dead four days. That in itself is a great feat because I've I've seen a body four days dead. It's not something you want to look at or get a whiff of. It's pretty bad. But for Jesus to raise Lazarus up truly was a miracle. Uh, of Jesus to take something that was that dead and bring it back to life again. That ought to tell us uh, sort of what I preached this morning. There is nobody too dead for God to raise back to life again. 
And so now we're looking at something that is way beyond four days dead. All we see is bones, and they're not like skeletons laying there, full skeletons. The bones are scattered all over this field. This great army of Israel suffered defeat, apparently, and their bodies were left laying out in this great field. And you know as well as I do that the scavengers will come in and they'll, they'll be the ones responsible for scattering the bones all over that field. Um, but anyway, so that's what we're dealing with. We're dealing with uh, disconnected bones, very, very dry, he says, lo, they were very dry, which means that they have been dead a long, long time. And so he said in verse 4, again, he said unto me, prophesy upon these bones and say unto them, O ye dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord God unto these bones, quote, behold, I will. Now that's a statement from God. If God said it, does he mean it? I, I, I didn't have, and I told you about the, the preacher that I really, I really, uh, I had a very special place in my heart for this man. And um, when he told me his belief about Israel, my heart sunk. I didn't have, uh, I didn't have the nerve, I didn't have whatever it might have took. To challenge him on that, I wouldn't have done it out of respect anyway. Uh, but had I said something to him, I would have just simply asked, please tell me when God said in Revelation 7, out of the tribe of Judah, 12,000, out of the tribe of Naphtali, 12,000, out of the tribe of Gad, 12,000, please tell me that when God said that, you're saying he didn't mean it. He said it, but he meant something other than what he said. And I just, I have a problem with that. I think if God said it, he meant it. If God said Gad, it was Gad. If God said Naphtali, it was Naphtali. If God said, uh, no, they're Gentiles, I, then they were Gentiles. But that's not what God said. In fact, there is a clear division in Revelation 7 between the blessing that Israel gets, the 12 tribes, and then right after that we see all of the people out of all the different nations, different languages, different races, different tongues, they're all uh, gathered around the throne of Jesus Christ and they're worshiping him. And, uh, you know, John asked the angel, who are these? And the angel said, these are days which came out of great tribulation. And uh, are washed in the blood of the Lamb, so on and so forth. So we have the Gentiles there, but we have Israel clearly delineated in the first part of Revelation chapter 7. And so here we have it again. O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Behold, I will cause breath to enter into you, and ye shall live. And I just believe that that's what God's going to do. And I will lay sinews upon you, and will bring up flesh upon you, and cover you with skin... And put breath in you, and ye shall live, and ye shall know that I am the Lord. That's one of my favorite phrases out of the Old Testament. God's always saying that and then, when this happened, then they shall know in Egypt that I am the Lord God. God said, I'm going to show Pharaoh, and I'm going to show all the Egyptians who really is God. Who's the Lord God? Who's the chief God of all gods? Who's the one with all the power? I'm going to show them that it's me. And you'll see that phrase all through the Old Testament. Then ye shall know. Then they shall know that I am the Lord God. Now, I love that because God is promising right here that Israel is going to know their God. Right now, they do not know him. Their God is Jesus Christ. Their God is God Almighty. They do not recognize who God is. And I don't even want to get into the bizarre Kabbalistic doctrines that most Jews now who go to synagogue or go to temple or whatever they do on the Sabbath, that is pure Kabbalah. Mysticism is what it is. But this is what God promised. And then he said in verse 7, So I prophesied as I was commanded, 
And as I prophesied, there was a noise. And behold, a shaking. And the bones came together. Bone to his bone. Imagine that. And when I beheld, lo, the sinews and the flesh came up upon them. And the skin covered them above. It's like reverse corruption. Right? It's just putting it in reverse. And we're going to put everything back like it was. Okay? Who can, who can put water back in a spilled bucket? God can. Every drop. So, notice this. When I, and behold, lo, the sinews and the flesh came upon them, and the skin covered them above, but there was no breath in them. Then he said unto me, prophesy unto the wind. Prophesy, son of man, and say, that's what the word prophesy means. It means to say what God said. And say to the wind, thus saith the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath. Four winds. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. O breath, and breathe upon these slain, that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived and stood up on their feet, an exceeding great army. Has God ever done that before? Adam. Adam was just laying there dead. But he, he was fully formed. He had, he had bones. He had sinews. That's the tissue that holds the bones to the muscles. And the muscles to the muscles. And then the flesh. All of the muscles. The blood. The arteries. The heart. The organs. The guts. Everything that belongs in the body, and then he covered it with skin, but it's just laying there, dead. So God tells Ezekiel again, a, a, a second prophecy, prophesy now unto the wind. And he prophesied to the four winds, and they lived and stood up upon their feet. And, and God breathed into Adam, into his nostrils, the breath of life. And Adam became a living soul, the Bible says. Now, my theory, and it's just a theory, is that there's a, there's a clear division here in this prophecy where when Ezekiel prophesies the first time, the bones come together, the sinews, the flesh, and then the skin covers them. They're together, but they're still dead. Israel, as a state, for the first time, in over 2,000 years, all of a sudden becomes a nation once again. A, a singular nation made up of the, the same kind of people or the same race of people. And that is the race of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and their descendants. So 1947, 1948, they come together. They have been given statehood. Um, they are recognized immediately by the United States, by Great Britain and other major countries around the world. They are recognized as, a, as an independent power, an independent nation. Uh, and that means then that other nations can go into treaties with them, that other nations must regard their borders, uh, that the people of Israel and the government of Israel is sovereign over that land because that land now belongs to the state of Israel. And so nations regard those borders. Nations are supposed to uh, work out treaties with Israel, trade agreements and so on. And, and their government joins with other governments in a, uh, a, a humanistic uh, plan to try to get along among nations. But what does Jesus say is going to happen in the last days? Nations shall be against nation and kingdom against kingdom. So we, we know there's going to be some of that going on in the last days. But anyway, so I see that, it, it, what I can see is that with this, the skin covering and all the flesh that they need, their bodies still laying there is Israel coming together as a nation, but they're still dead. They're still dead. There's no breath in Israel. There's no four winds blowing in Israel. And I mean the breath of the gospel. Um, and it's amazing because 
uh, one of the biggest, um, I guess, money-making things that Israel has uh, in its favor is tourism. Israel is a major place for Christians of every kind who want to go to Israel. You have Catholics, you have all the Protestant religions, people all over the, all over the United States take, they take trips to Israel. Uh, back in a better day, uh, whole churches would, would uh, buy tickets on a cruise or an airplane and they would fly over there and do this uh, tour of Israel. I think Brother Reg has been over there once. I, I've never been. I don't really feel like going. I'd rather stay here where it's safe for now. Uh, but anyway, uh, th all these Christians coming in and out of Israel every day. And I guarantee you, some of those Christians I know try to witness to those Jews over there, and those Jews won't hear it. They're hard-headed, hard-hearted. They will not hear the gospel. They'll take, the, they'll take Christian money, but they don't want Christian beliefs. Okay? Not yet. What's going to happen next? God's going to send the four winds, and Israel is going to breathe. Breathing is always a picture of life. It's a picture of the Holy Ghost inside of you. You have the breath of God living inside of you, the Spirit of God living inside of you. And I believe that one of these days Israel is going to believe the gospel and it will be for their salvation. It was always intended for the Jew first and also to the Greek. It was, it was always Israel first who needed to hear the gospel. And God's going to, right now, God has set Israel over here and he's working among the Gentiles all over the world. Praise the Lord. Uh, we see people saved in Kenya because of what God has done here. And I just absolutely love that. You couldn't ask for anything better for a church to do than to just see people saved all over the world. Amen. And I, I just love that. I love that God's doing that here. Uh, but... Most Jews, for the most part, they just will not listen. They don't, want to, they don't want to know anything about it. One of these days, I believe that's going to change, and they're going to raise up a mighty army. Now, go to Genesis 12. And this is um, one of the key points that I would make um, concerning Israel. And how, how we should regard them. You need to remember. Did God love Abraham? Oh yeah he did. Okay. God set his love upon Abraham. Abraham is of major importance to this world. Three major religions in the world. Christianity, Judaism and Islam. Both lay claim to Abraham being the father of their particular faith. Uh, the Muslim people through, of course, Ishmael, and um, Jews and Christians alike. But here's what God said. Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will shew thee. Now, one thing to do is keep in mind both the physical, actual reality of this and the spiritual side of this. God says to each one of us, and let me just ask you, how many of you want to live down here forever? Nope. Not until God makes a new one. Amen? Um, and he's going to. But where I want to be is up there. And so God says, Mike, you want to be with me you're going to have to leave your father's house, your country, the land of your kindred, and you're going to have to come to a, a land that I will show. And he shows it to us in the book of Revelation. We get to see it in the last three chapters of Revelation. John said, I saw a new heaven and a new earth. Oh, love that. And so anyway, that's the spiritual side of it. And then there's the physical side of it, the reality of it. That God has a physical location on this earth that he himself set aside 
to give to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob and their seed. And I will make of thee a great nation. Again, there is this, the physical side of that, the Jewish nation. Then there is the spiritual side of that. We are the Israel of God. We have been, we, we along with those believing Jews have been grafted in to the tree. The olive tree is Christ. We've all been grafted in. We are all then children of Abraham. We call Abraham our father because we accept what he accepted by faith. We've been given faith. Now, so God has made of us Gentiles a great nation. We are a peculiar people. Uh, our DNA is different than the world's DNA. Amen? So that's what makes us different. And he said, I'll make a great nation and I will bless thee and make thy name great. And thou shalt be a blessing. And think about our name. Christian. Who are we named after, Chris? Christ. Isn't that a great name? It's a name above all names. Amen? So, I will make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed think about the the genuine efforts of bible believing churches throughout the last 2000 years great things god has done through christian churches from all over this world to other places all over this world. Uh, just what little bit I know about our country is that uh, from the time we became a nation, and especially in the 1800s, a lot of the Christian denominations, their goal was to raise up missionaries who would leave this country and go to foreign soil whether it was in Africa, whether it was in the Middle East, whether it was in China or Japan or any of the Asian nations or India or any place that God laid on their heart, God would raise up missionaries out of this country, send them over to the dark areas of the world, the places where the, nobody has the gospel, send them over there to preach the gospel, to establish Christian churches. And I can say, having, having been to uh, Kenya more than once, I can tell you that Christianity has a strong hold in the nation of Kenya. There are a lot of Christian churches. Now, not all of them are the best in the world. But you get what I'm saying. There, there may be a mosque in that town, but there's far more, more Christians that live in that town than there are Muslims that live in that town. And then uh, Michael tells me that we're going to be in South Sudan. That's a, I didn't know that was its own country. South Sudan is predominantly and they speak English in that country so we'll get along just fine being heard over there and I'm hoping that the gospel will be heard and you can just go to places in Africa different nations uh, not so much in the north east part of Africa because that's primarily Muslim but you go south of there and you're going to find pockets of Christianity all around Africa well that didn't just start 10 years ago 20 years ago some of those Christian churches started all the way back in the 1800s. I mean, back when men had it hard going to places like that to preach the gospel. Uh, and the gospel thrived. And so literally, in thee, in Abraham, shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Number one, through Jesus Christ, because he was in the loins of Abraham at that time when God made that promise. And so here's what I would say in, on verse 3. If God said he would bless someone who blesses Israel, I think you ought to bless Israel. I think you ought to be a blessing to a Jew. Okay? Pick out your favorite Jew in the whole world and pray for him. Okay? Uh, because I, you never know. I don't know who God's going to pick to be part of those 12,000 from each tribe, but I'm, he's got their name written down already 
He knows who they are. Have they been born yet? I don't know. I just know that God's got all that in his hand and he's going to do it. And uh, when it all comes down, I don't want to be who Obadiah was talking about. I don't want to be Esau in that day. I don't want to be Edom who just stood, stood on the, uh, by the wayside and just watched it happen, watched all the enemies carry them away. Uh, I don't want to be that. I want to be the people that God blesses. I want our nation to be the nation that God blesses. I found out uh, today that the effectiveness of that Iron Dome defense system that uh, Israel has in place, and the reason why they were so successful in destroying upwards of 90, close to 99% of all the missiles that were sent their way, uh, all the drones that were flown over there to, de to drop bombs to destroy them, all of those things like that, uh, the effectiveness was done because uh, simulations and tests and modeling has been taking place for years down in Alabama. Our own military is already involved in the defense of the nation state of Israel. Okay, That's, uh, that has been consistently this nation's response to the Jewish state is that we will work with them and share some of our technology with them so that we can help protect the nation state of Israel. And that's what happened this weekend. It worked. It worked very well. And um, that, that is insider information that I got. All right. Now, I will curse him that curseth thee. Um, a case can be made for Great Britain being responsible for cursing Israel. In 19, I want to say 1914, 1917, one of those two years, there came the, what's called the Balfour Declaration. Uh, Great Britain, or the United Kingdom, basically held control over the land of Palestine. It was one of the places that the British Empire had colonized over the last 200 years of their greatness. There, there was a saying, the sun never sets on the British Empire. And that means that you could go anywhere in this world and there's going to be a colony of, of, is, uh, of Great Britain somewhere. That, I mean, they used to own Hong Kong, um, which is now part of China. They gave it back to China. And there was a time when the nation of Great Britain, United Kingdom, was a great nation. And it, you could judge that by all of the colonies that they had all over the world. India... I mean, Australia, Canada, you name it. They just had colonies everywhere. But I'm not going to get this piece of information right, so I, I, I don't remember exactly what it was they did. But it, if I remember right, um, the United Kingdom would not allow the creation of a Jewish state or would not allow the Jews to settle there or something like that, had they been allowed to go to the land of Palestine before World War II, Hitler wouldn't have had to gas all of those Jews. Most of them probably would have had a, a safe place to go to when they saw what Hitler was doing. And they would have escaped the furnaces of Nazi con concentration camps. But there was something, I can't remember what it was, but there was something that, is, that Great Britain did not allow the Jews to settle down there. And as a result, the sun started setting on the British Empire. They started losing their colonies all over the world. India, Australia, Hong Kong, you name it, wherever they used to be, Kenya, 
Kenya was uh, uh, British East Africa. And um, Kenya sued for its independence and got it. And in the 1960s, they became the nation state of Kenya. So the British lost that too. And uh, over and over and over, <clears throat> the nation of Great Britain, United Kingdom, dwindled down to what it is now. And they still may be losing territory, I don't know. But it dwindled down to what it is now. And it's nowhere near what it used to be as far as its greatness is concerned. And I believe that God did exactly what he said. They cursed Israel and God got them for it. Uh, the churches that used to be in England, those great churches, most of them are just museums now. And we know that the United Kingdom, as far as their morality is concerned, is no better, no worse than America is right now. And it's like we're right in, hand in hand with them. And so you look historically at any nation that was a blessing to Israel. God blessed those people. You look at any nation that is a curse. And I want to tell you something. I would not want to be Persian right now living in Iran. I would not want to be those people. In fact, um, they actually have a day, a holiday in Iran. I found this out this afternoon. They have a holiday in Iran where everybody comes out on the streets and they express their hatred toward the state of Israel and the United States of America. Both of them. They hate the Jews and they refer to us as the great Satan. I'm not so sure that they're not wrong on some of that. Uh, but anyway, they have a whole holiday dedicated to hating Israel and the United States together, both of them at the same time. And that ought to tell you something historically about uh, may, maybe it may be that God has not destroyed this nation because we've always stood by Israel. Now, let me give you an example of turn to Galatians chapter 4 or look there on the screen for time. Uh, I'm just going to run through a couple of these and you'll get the idea. Galatians chapter 4 verse 22, for it is written that Abraham had two sons. And what he's going to tell you now is what I, what's called typology or allegory. Um, foreshadowing is a, is a literary term. This is God giving us a picture of his doctrine or a prophecy of some kind. So you have Abraham having two sons. The one by a bondmaid, the other by a free woman. Which one was born first? The bondwoman. And what, remember what Jesus said. He who is first shall be last, and he who is last shall be first in the kingdom of heaven. And so look at it. When the bondwoman's son was born first, that bondwoman was born after the flesh. It was Sarah's idea. To have Abraham go into her servant, Hagar, and say, maybe, maybe God wants you to do it this way. That wasn't what God said. And so he, sure enough, she is, uh, has the child Ishmael, and automatically they start hating Sarah. And especially after uh, Isaac was born, they really started hating Sarah. And when Sarah had enough of it, she went to Abraham and said, Abraham, uh, you got to do something. This, this servant of mine has turned against me and our son, Isaac, and uh, you need to send him out. Well, Abraham went to God with it, and God said, do what she said. i got a plan for this. So now, here's what Paul is saying. But he who was of the bondwoman was born after the flesh, but he of the free woman was by promise, Sarah. Which things are an allegory, typology, foreshadowing, and so on. For these are the two covenants. The one from Mount Sinai. So Hagar, giving birth to Ishmael, represents um, Israel coming under the Mount Sinai covenant, the Ten Commandments. Whereby God said, if you do all ten of these, I'll let you live. If you don't do just one of them, the sentence is death. You cannot live. And so 
uh, they're under a curse. You and I were under that, that curse before we came to Jesus, under the new covenant. Then he says, the one from Mount Sinai, which gendereth to bondage, which is Agar. So Hagar, in this case, represents the people of Israel who are still holding on to the Ten Commandments. And Moses, as their lawgiver, Moses died. Um, the law, the tablets were broken. And the, the ministration of death, Paul said, was gonna, is going to vanish away. He taketh away the first that he may establish the second. It's like that nut I talked about uh, this week who said that Timothy was under two covenants. Mount Sinai and the New Testament. I'm going, it's not possible. You can't say that someone's under the gospel of works and then say they're under grace. The two of them don't like each other. They don't get along. Just like Hagar and Ishmael didn't get along with Sarah and Isaac. So Sarah and Isaac represent us of the Gentile world who are born by promise from God. Our lawgiver is not Moses. Our lawgiver is Jesus Christ. God's only begotten son who came down here and died, but he rose again from the dead. Amen. And he lives forevermore. So automatically, our covenant gives us liberty and gives us freedom. Freedom from the bondage of sin. But Israel is still under that bondage. However, uh, for this, Agar is Mount Sinai in Arabia, which answered to Jerusalem, which now is and is in bondage with her children. But Jerusalem, which is above, is free, which is the mother of us all. I love that. For Mary's not our mother. Amen. Who said that? Way to go, Everett. For it is written, Rejoice thou barren that bearest not. This is Isaiah 54. Break forth and cry thou that travailest not, for the desolate hath more children than she which hath an husband. Now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are the children of promise. But as then, he that was born after the flesh persecuted him that was born after the spirit. Even so it is now. Now, um, so the Bible's telling us that we are the children of promise like Isaac was born of Sarah. The Jews right now are the children of the slave woman, the bondwoman. And when they're born, they're born into bondage because of the Ten Commandments. So, what applies to us also applies to Israel. Jesus said, ye must be born again. And who did he first say that to? A Gentile? A Jew. In uh, John chapter 3. You must be born. Who was that, Nicodemus? Yeah. You must be born again. So if Israel and the people of Israel to have any hope, they must be saved exactly the way you and I were saved. By grace, through faith, and that not of ourselves. So, but what happened to Hagar? Did God forsake her totally? Genesis 21, and God heard the voice of the lad because Abraham gave him a loaf of bread and a bottle of water. That's it. The bread was gone, the bottle was spent. And the Bible says that after so long, Hagar set uh, Ishmael down and walked away from him to where she couldn't hear him screaming anymore. And she sat down in tears. And God heard the voice of the lad. Who's the lad in this case? The Jews. And the angel of God called to Hagar out of heaven and said unto her, What aileth thee, Hagar? Fear not, for God hath heard the voice of the lad where he is. Arise, lift up the lad and hold him in thine hand, for I will make him a what? It's exactly what God said to Abraham. And God opened her eyes. You remember, John, when God opened your eyes? And she saw a well of water. Remember when there was a woman who met Jesus? Where at? The well of water. So you know what that represents. And she went and filled the bottle with water and gave the lad to drink. So the story's not over with Hagar and her son born into bondage. 
God will make a great nation out of the Jewish people once again. Amen. Jacob and Esau. Genesis 25, 23, notice this. And the Lord said unto her, Two nations are in thy womb. Nations. That means types of people, races of people. A nation in the Bible. Um, how many of you can spot an Italian when you see one? Hey, John DeMano, hope you're watching. Okay. He is so eat up with Dagoism. Amen. All you got to do is get around him for a while and you'll, you'll see it. Uh, he was in town a while back, a few, maybe a week ago or something like that, and he went out to eat with some people. Guess where they went? The hill! <laughs> he chose that over coming to see me. I don't believe that. But anyway, uh, Italians come from Italy. Chinese people come from China. Japanese people who don't like Chinese people, and Chinese people don't like Japanese people at all. Um, they're still angry over that war, World War II. But anyway, Japanese people come from Japan. So God identifies nations by race, by their genes, their genetics, and who, they're, who they came from. Two nations are in thy womb, and two manner of people shall be separated from thy bowels. Two different types of people. Remember what I said this morning about Joshua and Caleb, um, that they had a different spirit in them than the rest of the Israelites did. The Israelites had a spirit of witchcraft in them, a spirit of rebellion, and they were rebelling against God. Joshua and Caleb had a different spirit in them, which is why they were saying, we can go into that land now, it's ours. Um, but anyway, this is what we're looking at here. The one people shall be stronger than the other people. Now watch this. I have two covenants in my Bible. And these covenants make two different types of people. This one makes a Jew. No matter who you are, this one makes a Jew born under bondage, born under the law. This one makes a Christian. Our DNA is different. We have a second birth, which means that we have a different father and a different mother. God is our father. Heaven is our, Jerusalem above is our mother. So here is the Christian. Here is the Jew. Here is uh, Jacob. Here is Esau. And how did God make Esau look? Huh? Harry. How bad was he, Harry? So bad that when Jacob went in to pretend he's Esau, he puts goat skin and fur on his arm, and his, his father felt that and was, yeah, that's Esau. I can't see him, but smells like Esau. Feels like Esau. There is a skin condition called hypertrichosis. I read... Ripley's Believe It or Not, and Guinness Book of World Records, so I know this. And uh, there is, uh, if you've ever, uh, P.T. Barnum had a dog boy in his show at one time, and this was somebody who had that disease. They grow fur all over their body. There is a family down in Mexico that it's in their genes, and so far every child they've had is covered with fur, okay? The idea is... One of them represents the beast. The other one represents Christ. They are contrary to the other. Amen? Two, and one people shall be stronger than the other people. Out of these two covenants, which one is stronger? The new one. Because the new one can, has enough power to get us all the way into heaven. The Old Testament cannot give us salvation. It was never designed for that. So this one is weak because it relies on human effort. This one is powerful 
because it relies on grace through faith. Amen? So, the, 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 the elder shall serve the younger. Who was born first, Jacob or Esau? Esau was the firstborn, and that's why Jacob did what he did to get uh, the, uh, the inheritance from him and to swindle him out of his birthright. Uh, was posing to be Esau, and he took the inheritance, and he took the birthright. And uh, now, did God, or let's say, did, um, did um, Isaac leave Esau completely empty-handed? No, he didn't. Um, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. And so here's the blessing of Jacob. Notice this. Cursed be everyone that curseth thee, and blessed be he that blesseth thee. That's the blessing of Jacob. Therefore God give thee of the dew of heaven, and the fatness of the earth, and plenty of corn and wine. Let the people serve thee, and nations bow down to thee. Be Lord over thy brethren, and let thy mother's sons bow down to thee. Cursed be everyone that curseth thee, and blessed be he that blesseth thee. That's the Abraham blessing. And notice that he's going to give him the dew of heaven, and the fatness of the earth, and plenty of corn and wine. When Esau's blessing, when Esau asked for a blessing, here's what Isaac said. Behold, thy dwelling shall be the fatness of the earth and the dew of heaven from above. That is identical to what God said, or uh, Isaac said to Jacob. Same blessing. But by thy sword shalt thou live and shalt serve thy brother, and it shall come to pass when thou shalt have the dominion that thou shalt break his yoke from off thy neck. And what I see in that is God is going to be done with the Gentile people. As far as salvation is concerned, he is going to send Jesus to appear in the clouds. All of us will, the dead in Christ rise first. We which are alive and mean shall be caught up together with them. We're going to be with Jesus in heaven. And God is going to turn off the salvation switch to Gentiles. Click. No more. He's going to reach over and turn on the salvation switch. For Israel, that's when the yoke is going to be taken from Esau's neck. It's similar to the blessing that God blessed Elijah with. And then Elisha wanted a double portion. And so God gave him a double blessing more than Elijah. So Elijah represents us and Elijah was taken into heaven by a chariot, angels of God came and got him, took him into heaven without dying. Elisha then takes the mantle, goes back across the Jordan River, goes into uh, the people of Israel and does twice as many things as Elijah did, including killing 42 children. They had it coming. They called him bald. Go up, thou bald man. Go up, thou bald man. And... Elisha prophesied against them and two she-bears came out and ate them. Killed 42 of them. That's a picture of the beast, by the way. All right. So anyway, that's just a short version of the... Uh, there's more in here. Um, um, R Rachel and Leah are a type of this. Um, Ruth and Naomi are a type of this. Naomi is Israel. Ruth's the Gentile bride of the kinsman redeemer and when the kinsman redeemer marries ruth who gets the blessing naomi does she gets her land back and she now has a son who was raised up unto her dead husband to take over and uh, inherit the inheritance of her husband and that's israel all right so anyway let's stand for prayer i kept you way too long